what I'd really like to do now, since we're running out of time, is open the floor to our audience here in the room, as well as the online audience, for questions and comments to the panel. And we'll give Dan a, a chance to, uh, to <coughs> have a final word at the end of the session. So if you could please identify yourself before you ask your question and keep it brief and to the point, I'd really appreciate that. Any questions or comments? Yes. Have a microphone, uh, please. Uh, Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one category of people whom you haven't mentioned, even that was not mentioned on the uh, case we had here on Wednesday, last Wednesday. I was itching to say that, but I failed to. I have to say it today. Uh, the ca one ca category of people who are oppressed by their own government and the aid doesn't reach them. And the confl um, conflict insensitive aid that reaches the oppressive government um, exacerbates the conflict. And over the last 65 years, uh, the socio-economic environmental uh, fabric of the, society, the ethnic societies has gone down like this. While in the last 65 years, science and technology has advanced uh, some of the people up there. This we are down there in a few years' time. Uh, there won't be Tamils there to even to raise any questions here. Last week, no, to uh, sorry, can you sorry. can you um, okay? Right. The what about uh, the people? Analysis. Okay. Yeah. What about the yeah. people who are oppressed by their own government and who do not get the aid? And but the conflict insensitive aid goes to the go oppressive government, and more and more oppression happens. Thank what you. do we do? Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. I think. Um, gentleman behind, yeah, and then Sarah. Yeah, hi, David Matias from Save the Children. Um, I guess my, my question, Dan, is somewhat in related relation to what D Duncan was talking about um, and how much disaggregation you did in the piece between um, maybe dual mandate organizations and single mandate organizations and how much of a acute shock response is colored by um, how organizations are dealing with chronic situations and how they're dealing with stresses in a particular context. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Bailey, and I'm a consultant on humanitarian issues. Uh, I'm going to go for a vague question, which is, um, you know, it kind of goes to that last slide where you're talking about what you might do, so it's a bit preemptive. Uh, but Dan, it's around uh, suggestions about how we can address some of the challenges. And uh, I'm hoping you might be able to, to kind of give us a bit of insight on you know, the extent to which we're talking about kind of analytical capacity problems that could be you know, addressed on, on that way leads to a certain set of solutions, but also uh, the extent to which some of this is around, well, that the humanitarian system and the way we organize ourselves mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily lead to optimal, you know, doing the right thing, which poses another, you know, set of much more tricky mm -hmm. problems. So if you could maybe discuss a bit about some potential ways forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, we don't seem to have any online at the moment, so let's go with those. Um, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to start at this end of the panel. I don't know, Nick, if you want to comment on any of those. Um, maybe Sarah's vague question, <laughs> <laughs> since that leaves plenty of room. <laughs> um, I g I, one, of, one of the issues we haven't talked about, which I think is quite a useful way of going forward on this, is to look at the issue of coordination, um, coordination around analysis. I mean, I think insofar as analysis is better analysis and linking that analysis to decision making is part of the solution, as opposed to kind of system changes, which you're referring to as well there. Um, I think there are, there are huge opportunities for, for a much better collective ways of working on these, these issues. I think it's, it's partly a question of efficiency, better use of limited resources. Each agency can't expect to cover all of these competencies in individually. Um, and it's, it's partly a, a, a question of having a collective vision and an idea of, of what the priorities are and, and what the ways are to move forward. And there, I think, 
in a humanitarian situation where you're maybe not working through the, the governments, it's we're back to the cluster system. You know, hate it or love it. <laughs> um, I, I can't see another option on the table at the moment. I think we have to we have to engage there. I think there is a problem in those humanitarian contexts about how we do contingency planning sometimes. You know, if the, if the architecture hasn't, the coordination hasn't yet been established, um, you know, how do you do the upfront work on this analysis that, that needs to, to feed into it? So just those comments. Thanks, Nick. Simon. Um, quickly, the, yeah, the, the comment on um, how you work with the government, um, it's not merely, I mean, yeah, there are cases where governments are oppressing some of the people who you're trying to help, but, but far more cases as well, just of cases where the government is itself in some way implicated, you know, is, is an actor with, uh, in the problem, particularly within conflicts. And even broader than that, I think we have to recognise that there is, if you like, a political dimension to everything you, we do. I mean, if we give aid which is outside the government system, we, can, we, we, may, be we may, I'm not saying we will, be changing people's perceptions of the government and making it more negative because we, you know, we have more resources, for example, and they're not doing it, we are. If we give aid through the government, we may be increasing people's confidence in the government, which may or may not be a good thing. Whatever we do, there are going to be political consequences of what we do. Um, um, so having political, I having an impact on the politics of a country is not in a sense wrong because it's inevitable. Um, what I do think is wrong and in fact inexcusable is working in a way which has political consequences which I couldn't even be bothered to think about. So I think we have an absolute moral obligation to, con to, <laughs> to consider how... Um, how I how I work, what kind of longer term consequences and political consequences might might that have? Which is not only around central governments; it can be around local power leaders. It can be even on the you know the gender side and so on. So if I'm not thinking about that, um, then I am I believe I would argue then I am morally responsible for um, any mess that I create, and there will be some. Which doesn't mean to say that you're necessarily morally responsible for the outcomes if you have thought about it, because you can't, you know, you can't think about everything and stuff happens, and there'll always be things that you haven't thought about. So I would say that on that. Very briefly on um, um, on the how to move forward, and it'd be very brief. Yeah, coordination of analysis, absolutely, um, 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 absolutely. What, what when it was saying, as long as coordination doesn't get turned into what it tends to get turned into, which is kind of more coordination meetings. <laughs> so we're going to have a new strategic coordination working group, which, and then we'll have a technical coordination work, you know, and so on and so on and so forth. And that is not coordination, and it's not analysis, and it's not planning. It's meetings and forms. And if we turn this into another tool, then I think you know, we're going to be in a problem. Um, I mean, in a sense, even response, response analysis is frameworks are, are quite funny. I mean, the whole process is around deciding what to do. And if someone said to you, kind of, what decision-making tool do you use? And you say, well, which, for which kind of decisions? And someone said, you know, for any decision, you know, what tool do you use for making all decisions? You, you know, you'd scratch your head, as I, as I, as I will do. Um, so we kind of got to get away from that. We've got to, you know, it's got to be, I, I think one of the most important things in the paper, that, that, that uh, Dan, that you say, is the place for response analysis is not there after the crisis. It's in the contingency planning. It's before the crisis. It's just thinking about what do we do. It's bringing, as you say, bringing together the development of humanitarian. It's also bringing together multiple perspectives. I mean, I don't know if we have any climate change people in the room. Probably not, because they would have put up their hand and said, "Where's the climate change in there? <laughs> kind of, you know, why not? Where's the macroeconomic? Where's the demographic? Where?" And so on. The more perspectives we get around tables, thinking, arguing, discussing, just the more the better informed we all are about everything, um, and not. Tr if it goes to the cluster system, my own personal view is it's. It, Kind of de death by cluster, death by coordination. <laughs> It'll be death by coordination. <laughs> so, and that then the last thing is, if it's not a technical problem, it's a bureaucratic one. And if the cluster system isn't the answer, then how do we go about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that. Thank you, Simon. Duncan. Um, I think on that, Sarah, the point you made was really useful. I think yes, we can <coughs> focus on the tools, and in some cases, the the technical solutions. We can have. And we have a lot of better responses, as Dan was saying, in the past 10, 15 years. We have a lot more options of how we do things, not just in food security, but in health, in nutrition, in education. But it's more how we do them and not what we do. So it is, I think, definitely a, a, syst a question about the system and the architecture that we have, which I've alluded to in my comments about disaster resilience. How can we answer Simon's question of, 
a community has has hopes and aspirations, what do we need to do in order to help them achieve that? What what can we contribute? Not just saying what needs to be done and what are the needs and how can we deliver that education or whatever it is, but how does the system together, whether it's the humanitarian system, which is a word I don't really like, or the development sort of system, how can we use that? Um, a lot of the work we're doing, some of my colleagues who may have met are working more on the preparedness side, and I would agree very much with the comments you made, that a lot of this you need to be thinking through beforehand. Who would we work with? What are the networks? And how could we implement potentially a different way, rather than it being a sudden last minute, oh, we'll go with the people we used last time because we've got a day to decide. And I, your question about dual mandated organisations, having worked for a number of NGOs, dual mandated and single mandate, and also UN agencies, some have two hats. It is a key question and we have a lot of discussions with um, the NGO resilience group that particularly agencies like Save the Children, like World Vision, like Oxfam that have long-term ongoing programs, they have people on the ground who are involved in development programming who potentially are the best place to respond in a, in a crisis but we somehow sort of forget them in the whole process. So I think there's definitely an issue particularly with single mandated humanitarian organisations as we're now starting to sort of some ways blur the boundaries which could be seen as a good thing for those agencies there is a slight concern about sort of mission creep and how do we defend that humanitarian space to respond to those sudden onset crises where we do need people like the ambulance just went past we do need people who are there and ready to go when there is an earthquake but then there's that big chronic crisis situation which i think is the really sort of that's the difficult nut to crack Yes, and, and uh, before I hand over to Dan, who I'm sure has uh, quite a lot to say on all these questions, I think that's an interesting one because I know in my own experience, having worked for agencies, NGOs in the past, that there have also been different shifts in thinking in terms of that, where we used to be asked to respond to crises within our development programs, mm -hmm. using those resources, but calling it on external resources from headquarters or regional offices when necessary. But then that was seen to be, you know, inadequate or not to address the acute emergencies. And then big humanitarian departments were established when set aside, you know, where country directors sometimes would be asked to step aside if there was a feeling that uh, by the emergency people that they weren't reacting quickly enough, you know, is another uh, issue that's come up. So there are lots of these things, I think, that are being debated and that come round in a cyclical fashion within agencies. Dan, would you like <laughs> to uh, respond? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, maybe a, a sort of an overall response it, uh, in, in reaction to a number of things that we've been talking about is that I, I, I don't think that there is a right way to do I any of this. So much of this is is uh, context specific. So much of it depends on. Um, you know, the, the, the nature of what's happening at a particular p place at a particular time, which is in a way to reiterate what Simon says about, you know, first of all, you have to know what's going on and what, <coughs> what people themselves are trying to achieve and what governments themselves are trying to achieve, um, et cetera. So, you know, we, we didn't say anything in here particularly about whether um, response analysis or for that matter, um, all kinds of other analytical processes and, and uh, planning processes, et cetera, should be government-led or should be, or, or should be um, agency-led. And it's, it's, it's precisely because you, you, can't, um, y you can't generically define that question. It, it, it depends a lot on what's, what's happening in a given location at a given time, um, which I think gets a little bit at the question of, of um, um, you know, oppressed people or, or government uh, complicity or even responsibility for crises in the first place under some circumstances and governments under other circumstances being um, very legitimately the, the body that, that should, and sometimes, not always, is um, um, leading the response. There, there's been a lot of work done about uh, you know, whether we're sort of state-avoiding um, entities in the humanitarian world, or for that matter, even in the development world. Um, so I, I, you know, we, we didn't tackle that problem head on, but it, it's, you know, if, if, if there is a message here, it's about wh what can we, wh what can we draw out of this that's generic that we can actually fruitfully use in, in every situation to make sure that we're asking the right questions um, 
and, and conducting the, the, the minimum amount of analysis that will inform action or inaction or support for other people's actions, et cetera. Um, on, on the question about disaggregation between dual mandate and single mandate agencies, actually it's, it, it's increasingly difficult to find a single mandate agency anymore. Um, I suppose if, if you find you know, real purists, um, you, you, you could still claim that, that some country programs for the International Committee of the Red Cross are, are single mandate humanitarian only programs. But on the other hand, um, all the places that we looked in the field, uh, you know, the, 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 the ICRC has been operating in Somalia for, for um, I don't know how many years, but at least as long as I've known Somalia. And you know what what they actually do sort of sort of um, echoes back and forth between looking more like acute humanitarian response or looking more like sort of longer term support something or other. Not necessarily we wouldn't necessarily use the D word to describe it, but it'd be something close to that. <laughs> and I, I think that's true <laughs> of I, I think that's true of a, of a lot of agencies. So in a way, it's 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 difficult to um, even say who's a dual mandate agency and who's a single mandate agency, much less, you know, where does one of these things start and the other one, <laughs> and the other one end. So I, th I, th I think most of what we're talking about here is agencies that understand something about courses for courses, but then, you know, okay, what are those courses, which I guess you could say is context analysis, and what are those courses, which is basically the, the question we were trying to tackle, which is, which is what's, the appropriate, uh, what's the appropriate response. So I, I guess that's a way of answering your question by saying, no, we didn't actually do that much disaggregation because we didn't really find that much of another category to, to separate out and say this, this, this only does um, humanitarian response, or for that matter, this only does um, you know, a development response, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, but let me tackle Sarah's question a little bit. Um, we were looking at what we thought was an analytical question. And it turns out that there is a fair amount of room for improvement in the kinds of analysis that we can or should do, and a, f a fair amount of, of, um, of <coughs> <coughs> space for um, improving that. At the same time, people told us that they had <coughs> tools coming out their ears, and the last thing that we wanted was another another tool. Um, in fact, we, we we jokingly referred to this paper that Wendy has here as <coughs> as our rant because it well it's not exactly a rant. Um, we were referring to this as our non-tool, and so you know response analysis non-tool spells spells <laughs> rant. So we, we were sort of referring to this as our as our non-tool, and it. Um, but but more seriously. Um, the places where we saw real changes being made was often not because somebody was suddenly doing a better job of analysis and they had therefore convinced all the relevant decision makers that actually we should do X instead of Y. Um, it was often much more somebody at a, at a much higher level making a kind of a top-down decision to say, actually, you know what, chaps, we need to be able to do both X and Y and we need to have in place the analytical capacity to decide which. And that, that it was more decisions like that that were actually driving change on the ground than it was, you know, better BAM officers or better, uh, uh, you know, food security analysis um, happening on the ground and sort of convincing people up the, up the chain. Now, there have been people on the ground doing that kind of analysis and trying to make their voices heard up the chain for years, and maybe one could say that they finally had some impact. Um, but again, without, without dropping too many names here, um, WFP Kenya has set about to, to rebuild itself from the ground up to be able to do in-kind responses or market-based responses, depending on their analysis of the situation. And, you know, Kenya is a place where you can do this. There are mobile banking systems. There are telephone networks. There are, um, you know, some, some of the necessary <coughs> support structures to be able to have um, um, multiple responses, depending on what the situation is at the time. But that wasn't because there was a su suddenly increased analytical capacity in WFP Kenya that said we should do things like this, we should do things like that. It was very much a top-down decision, and it was deciding that Kenya was a good place to give it a try. And when they started doing this, they realized that they had to rebuild that country office from the ground up. It wasn't just a matter of changing the program. 
they had to change program, they had to change finance, they had to change logistics, they had to change M&E, they had to change um, everything. And it, 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 it required a fairly powerful decision maker to decide we're going to go this direction as opposed to better analysis saying actually we ought to veer this direction, if you see what I mean. So in, in a way, um, it's, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of a chicken and egg thing. Um, and, and it's hard to say wh who's the chicken and who's the egg. Clearly, analysts calling for better analysis or better application of the, in of the information that we have has led to certain kinds of changes. Um, and then those kinds of changes have led to saying, okay, if we, if we now have this range of response options, if we now have better situational analysis, et cetera, um, then we, we better set ourselves up in a different way to be able to actually capitalize on those things. So it's, it's, it, it isn't just an analytical capacity question, but it's also not just a question of, of high level change. It's, it's something about the interaction between those. Um, and if I may, since several people have raised the question about coordination, um, we actually didn't say too much about this in the paper because we were trying to keep the paper itself as evidence-based as possible. And there isn't a whole lot of evidence about uh, whether or not coordinated, um, for that matter, um, situational analysis is an improvement on individual agency um, assessment or analysis, and almost none about whether coordinated response analysis is, is an improvement or not. Th there was an attempt made at this. That's what the FAO RAF um, project was sort of about, was, was um, trying to get everybody around the table to, to, to um, to draw up uh, a, a grand strategy and then everyone finding their particular niche within that grand strategy. And it kind of ended up being a little bit of a continuation of, of what had already been going on. And I, I don't think that process is, is actually still carrying on. It did seem to us that if, if, if either, you know, sort of situational analysis or causal analysis and response choices or response analysis remains an agency level activity, it is by definition going to be very atomized and probably not very strategic. But it's hard to show a place where um, you can sort of compare uh, coordinated process with uh, a more atomized process and say actually the coordinated process works better. But you know, like a lot of our tools being kind of logically based rather than necessarily empirical, um, one can see that you know if, if 19 agencies were all doing um, very good analysis using uh, a Mufira tool or an Emma tool or something like that, and not taking into account the fact that 18 other agencies are doing precisely the, the same um, analysis, you could easily see how, th how the response might get very skewed in a certain direction and might actually cause all kinds of market problems when um, just a, a sort of a scattered re response might not. So I, I, I do strongly believe that um, you know, a, a some kind of strategic coordination in, in response planning and response analysis is called for, but it's, it's a little bit hard to make an evidence-based case for it. It's more of a sort of a logic case. Um, but then that gets back to the question of, of who. And in a somewhat different life, we were working at the same time on um, a, a, a small project on, on looking at the, the um, potentials and, and potential pitfalls and so forth that face this new global food security cluster. And so we were, we were thinking to ourselves, well, you know, is the cluster the mechanism for this? And in some cases, you know, in, in, um, in, in an obviously acute emergency, it probably is. But the problem with the cluster system is that its mandate becomes unclear when there is not an acute crisis. In some countries, they actually get closed down. In some countries, they sort of go dormant. Um, in some countries, um, for example, Kenya, there seemed to be a kind of a zenith in the trajectory of clusters after the 2008 post-election violence, and then the Kenya Food Security Steering Group kind of reemerged to, to play a longer-term role, which was actually not a bad, not a bad tag team, um, at least idea, at least model to, to, to follow. But in other countries, um, if, if, there's, if there's not an acute emergency, there isn't a cluster system, and therefore some of these um, issues that get related more to to the question of resilience or longer term programming, whether you call that humanitarian or you call it development or you call it transition, whatever, isn't clear. So um, I, th I think that there is definitely a need for and a role for someone to be the strategic coordinator for this, um, but a lot of disagreement about, about who it should be and under, under what circumstances it should be who. And it, it relates back to your question about the government. 
Um, in some cases, it clearly should be uh, the government. In other cases, that may um, either not work out very well or may actually um, worsen the problem, as you, as you implied. Um, I could say a lot more, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. We're running out of time now, but I just wondered if anyone else had any burning questions. <laughs> Will you if nobody's coming. Well, I, I'm, I'm really looking for new, um, yes. new questions here. I mean, I, Miles. Yeah, I guess <coughs> one of the things that, that I found particularly personal kind of very useful in, in your paper, Dan, was this distinction between the first level and the second level, the kind of the strategic decision making and, and the more operational. Um, and I guess it's striking, given that your, your research was based in the horn in kind of 2011, 2012, and also drawing on Simon's earlier paper about systems failure um, and, the, and the slow response. Mm -hmm. The example you gave where um, kind of some of the response analysis might have actually been contributing to that slow response and also that it seemed like most of the emphasis seemed to be on the second level rather than on, on the first level, more strategic decision making. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be very interested to hear um, what you found, the, the differences between the, the analysis that donors were making and that more operational agencies were making, particularly on that more strategic level and, uh, and making sure there was an early response. Um, did, you see, did you see a distinction there? Because that would seem to be, you know, that's where some of that top-down decision-making, just like you described for WFP in Kenya, sometimes needs to come from. So, you know, it does come from. So just what, what difference do you see between donors and agencies in that first-level analysis? Thanks, Miles. And, and do you think that, the, that it's going to make a difference, what happened in Somalia? Do you think that that is going to be a catalyst in itself for um, more of a focus on better response analysis and choice? I'm going to ask Dan to, to have a go at that, and if any of our other panelists want to comment, and then we have to wrap up. Um, well, to answer your question first, I, I, I think definitely. I, I think there's been a lot of there's been a lot of um, uh, rumination, particularly about the, the the sort of not only late response but sort of early warning, late response, and where have we heard this story a thousand times before? Kind of question. Um, so I think that there that, that there probably will be a lot of a, a lot of um, changes as a result of that. Um, whether or not that makes for better for better programming um, is perhaps a slightly s different question, but I, I don't think there's much question that, that even that even you know um, second best or third best options um, as opposed to the first best option in, in the case of Somalia in 2011 would have been an improvement over, over what actually happened, which in point of fact, wasn't wasn't much for quite a while, or at least nothing um, on the scale required for quite a while. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure to what extent um, a lack of focus on uh, or, or a lack of clarity about whether it was a, a strategic choice or a, a more m tactical or, or, or modality choice. Um, Would necessarily have made a difference or not? I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, Miles. I'll, I'll think about that for a second. Um, my fear is that um, everybody kind of wants to forget about what happened in, in you know, this, this, the specifics. Everybody wants to say, okay, we learned our lesson. We, we need to. We need to act more quickly. Um, now let's 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 move on. The, the agenda in Somalia is now different, and it is. I, I I think that there are some there are some things though that it. it um, probably bears going back and looking at in, in greater depth. And one of them is exactly what it was that was going on, particularly in sort of the first half of 2011. Um, again, in a slightly different life, I've been part of, a, of an evaluation of the unconditional cash and voucher response uh, to, the, to the crisis in Somalia. And it's clear that there was a group of, of agencies and for that matter, a group of donors that were that were quite interested in in pursuing um, a, a cash transfer or voucher kind of response, um, and quite interested in doing so earlier. Why it didn't happen, I think, is is probably um, the more instructive question. And I suspect, although I don't know for a fact, I I, I suspect that it was differences between um, 
people who saw the situation on the ground and people who are making decisions in headquarters, and those two just, just not matching up until suddenly there was you know, sort of no denying it. But there was also lots of other things. There was, there was all kinds of issues around um, at least where um, agencies that are dependent on U.S. funding were concerned, um, issues around counterterrorism and whether or not you could actually control where aid was ending up and clear worries about not only aid going astray, but aid going astray in such a way that you were actually in violation of domestic U.S. law, which, of course, scared any American, whether you're working for an American organization or you're working with American funding, um, and certainly had, to, had played some role in WFP pulling out of, this, of, the, of the country in, in 2010, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there are all kinds of things going on that may be specific to Somalia, and it may be more generic to, to this question. Um, but I, d I do think it's important that we go back and look at that. It's, it's, it's not necessarily just to inform um, better response analysis or better response choice, but it's also about um, informing the whole question of, you know, we've, we've said a lot here about the humanitarian versus a development agenda and where those overlap. But what about the difference between, you know, the humanitarian agenda and a much broader sort of security or counterterrorism agenda? You know, that doesn't, you know, it, it, it sort of enters into this, but it's, it's often sort of a, a question that's shunted to one side. And I think we have to look at all those things to really understand what, what happened in Somalia and what are the sort of bigger takeaway um, messages from that experience. But that's not a very adequate answer to your question. <laughs> but thank you very much, Dan. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to bring the session to a close. But I wanted to thank all of our panelists, to thank Dan for taking time out of another meeting that he's in to join us today. Um, and Duncan and Nick and Simon. Simon's actually in the same meeting, so uh, <laughs> we've, we've poached, poached both of them. But I think it was a really interesting session. I hope that you'll read the paper. And of course, I think, Dan, I can say that you're always uh, interested in feedback, and so are mm, we yes. at, the, at the HPN. So thanks to all of you for coming and to those who joined us online. And if you could leave the room as quickly as possible <laughs> and move into room E, where we have, I think it's room E, isn't it, Tanya, where we have refreshments for you. So thanks again. Thank you.